So um, just before we begin, we um, a number of our organizations got together earlier in the summer and we were reflecting on what had happened over the last two years of the pandemic. And everybody was talking about, you know, we're through the pandemic and everything's going to be going back to this world that we were before. But clearly for us as disabled people, that isn't the real story. Um, not only did the pandemic shine a light on the inequalities um, and really um, strike lots of fear for many disabled people about how quick and easy it was for government to roll back many of our hard won rights um, over that period. And I know for a lot of us, um, the pandemic is not over and we're still having to isolate while the rest of the world seems to think that they can carry on as, as, as normal. So we wanted to get this conversation going here today. Um, and so I'm delighted to um, kind of welcome you all to it and introduce uh, Chloe from, um, uh, Chloe, if you could switch your screen, there she is, um, from the Disability Policy Center. And Chloe is going to start us off with the first um, com conversation piece, Chloe. Thank you, Cameron. Um, hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk to all of you today. Uh, my name is Chloe Shender Wilson. I'm one of the co-founders of the Disability Policy Centre. Uh, we're a new organisation we just set up uh, this time last year, actually. Sorry, can you slow down, please? Can you slow down, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Rona. I will. Um, so just to repeat, my name is Chloe Shender Wilson. I'm one of the co-founders of the Disability Policy Centre. Uh, we're a relatively new organisation um, looking at solutions for how to break down barriers for disabled people across society. And I'm here to talk about, um, my brief was around cost of living, but I feel like what I wanted to use this opportunity to talk about following on from, from Cameron's introduction was how do we use this moment to be able to, as a catalyst, to be able to create real change? We know that um, the the pandemic was, you know, uh, was hugely disproportionately impacted disabled people. And we know that the cost of living crisis has hugely uh, impacted disabled people more than anybody else. Uh, we know that cost of living was already higher for people who were disabled or those with caring responsibilities. And the scope price tag report of 2019 uh, showed that this on average was about 583 pounds a month, uh, the cost of, for every single person things like transport, electrical equipment, heating, medicine, care. You know, we're all here today, we all probably know this ourselves anecdotally, that, that our options are limited and that the cost of living is, is hugely greater and the stresses and strains are, are much greater. And this has been exacerbated over the, over the pandemic and then over the current crisis too. And it feels like many people are trapped in situations, you know, it's not easy to just go and work an extra shift or, or change something around in your daily routine, you know, people are using life saving equipment, people are making life saving calls, having to have care on a daily basis and, and a, a lot of the sort of media, um, media and government narratives have sometimes been that, you know, someone can just get out of something themselves, which obviously is not the case and we know that. What I really wanted to highlight, though, is, is I feel that it has not many days have gone by where I haven't seen another story in the news and I haven't seen uh, someone like the BBC or Sky News reporting on the outstanding work that, you know, Cameron's organisation, Disability Rights UK, Scope, the MS Society. There's been so much of the whole movement coming together and the whole disability community, various charities and organisations being able to campaign on these issues. And I feel that there has been some, well, there's been some, great success from these charities and there's been some real attention from policymakers and decision makers it I know that it's not really enough and, and the payments haven't been anywhere near enough as what they should have been but the fact that that even in the budget things have been mentioned that there have been one-off payments or there have been BBC journalists sort of speaking about these issues I feel has been a breakthrough in being able to highlight the issues that disabled people and carers face and I guess what I wanted to do is or for us to think about, we're on this call to, uh, to talk about the inequality of disability and to talk about the barriers that hold people back. And I, I don't want to preempt some outstanding speakers that are coming after me talking about employment, talking about financial inclusion, talking about you know, the workforce, education. And I guess looking, looking forward past this winter now, once we come out of it, I wanted to think about what are we gonna do 
to actually break down those barriers? Why are disabled people disproportionately impacted by the cost of living crisis? Why were they disproportionately impacted by the pandemic? Why do we live in a society where disabled people are still held back in every single area of life? Uh, it, it just simply isn't fair and it's, it's not justice. And we should be doing better, especially in, in a nation as rich as we are. So I, I guess I just wanted to, to, to spark the conversation and to have the debate and to hear from all of you this evening is to, as we move forward now, you know, in areas from education, employment, transport, whatever it may be in society, what are the solutions? That was sort of our, or that was our motivation for setting up as, a, as an organisation last year. And I guess I'd love to just hear from all of you this evening as to um, how we go forward now. How do we spark I'm so tired of hearing negative stories in the press all of the time. You know, how do we change that narrative now? Now we have the attention into something positive and, and how do we move forward from here? So I'm going to leave it there. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from, from the presentations coming next and uh, just to hearing the conversation and, and having the conversation with all of you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Chloe. And I'm sure that's going to prompt lots of questions and comments from people. So please do hold on to your questions and comments um, for a, a little while later. So I'm just going to introduce Meta, who's um, from Disabled Students UK. Uh, Meta, I'm just going to spotlight you so people can see you. Give me two seconds and I will remove Chloe. So Meta, welcome and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me and see the presentation? Yes, we can uh, hear you and we can see the presentation. Thank you. Great. Um, so my name is Meta, as has been stated. I'm the founder of Disabled Students UK. Let me do a quick sensory description. I'm a white person in my late 20s with an accent that's a mix of Swedish, American and British English. Um, I'm going to be talking about education, specifically higher education. So over the last five academic years, the numbers of uh, UK students with a declared disability has increased by 46%, today making up almost one in five home students. This increase is likely to accelerate as 3% of the UK population is now suffering from long COVID, more than 3% at the moment. Despite protective legislation, disabled students have historically been marginalized. To legally and ethically accommodate the increased diversity of student needs, the higher education sector will need to become more accessible. The pandemic has demonstrated that higher, edu higher education has an enormous untapped potential for accessibility. By forcing universities to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances, the pandemic encouraged them to develop capacities such as online learning, which might, might otherwise have taken a decade. The challenge now is not sliding backwards, but rather building on this momentum to create a higher education sector that is accessible, whether you're autistic, going through cancer treatment, or are a full-time carer. So in 2021, Disabled Students UK sent out a survey and received more than 300 responses from disabled students across the UK, providing us with incredibly rich data concerning how disabled students have experienced the pandemic. In particular, we were inspired by the answer to the last question in our survey. What lessons do you hope that your university learns from the, from the pandemic to become more accessible moving forward? Can I just check that the speed is all right? We've not had anything else. Anyone say anything? Right. I think the speed you're going at is, is a good one, Meta. Thank you for our checking. Good. So based on the answers to, these, um, to this question, we created a report called Going Back is Not a Choice, which presents five key lessons to guide higher education providers on how they can move forward toward a more inclusive higher education provision. I'll take you through each of these um, one at a time. Lesson one, take an anticipatory approach. In some ways, accessibility improved during the pandemic, largely due to a few institution-wide policies, such as online access to lectures and removing time limits from assessments. 
Many students with fatigue or auditory processing issues, for instance, have had a level of access that they never experienced before. 85% of disabled students in our survey report that they would benefit from online learning being an option for them after the pandemic. This shows the enormous influence of a few key universal policies applied equally to disabled and non-disabled students. Taking an anticipatory approach to find and implement such policies going forward will allow higher education providers to increase accessibility more efficiently. Lesson two, resource staff to be able to provide accessible education. There was a lack of individualized disability support during the start of the pandemic and a failure to incorporate accessibility into the delivery of institution-wide policies. Only 23% of disabled students surveyed agreed that they had received the disability support that they have, had, have required during this time. This emphasizes the need for staff to have the appropriate resources and training to be able to implement accessibility in practice. Lesson three, build on compassionate attitudes. Many universities implemented more flexible and compassionate policies for their students at the start of the pandemic, for instance, regarding extensions, demonstrating that such approaches do not have to come at the expense of what's called academic rigor. Considering that disabled students face challenging circumstances during non-pandemic times as well, Students in our survey wish to see such policies applied to disability specific contexts as well. Lesson four, reduce the administrative burden. At the start of the pandemic, many disabled students were asked to provide evidence anew in order to receive adjustments for online learning. These students were almost three times less likely to have the support they needed a year into the pandemic. This provides a clear example and clear evidence of the fact that when disabled students have to shoulder a large administrative burden, this effectively blocks their access to education on equal terms. Reducing the administrative burden is one of the most cost-effective ways to increase accessibility for disabled students. And finally, lesson five, taking responsibility for disabled students' access through effective leadership. Disabled students have been asking for accommodations like lecture recordings for years before the pandemic. And yet it wasn't until able students needed them that they were put in place. The survey results paint a picture of disabled students being consistently forgotten while able students were accommodated. The only way to ensure that accessibility is prioritized going forward is through competent leadership, which enables a coherent whole institution approach and a culture of responsibility. As pandemic restrictions in the UK disappeared, the modal student, the average student, no longer needed the provisions such as lecture recordings. The main groups that would benefit from continued provision of such practices were now marginalized students, students who were disabled or spoke English as a second language, for instance. As this shift in beneficiaries has happened, we've seen some universities stop their provision of lecture recordings, requiring students to go back to a completely in-person education. This disregards the fact that for some students, going back is not a choice. Pre-pandemic education was never accessible to them. Other universities, on the other hand, are learning from the pandemic to create more accessible higher education institutions than ever. DSUK is currently undertaking an evaluation of accessibility at each UK university. In the summer of 2023, when this is published, it will give a clear evidence as to which universities are learning the lessons of the pandemic and which are trailing behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meta. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to remove you, Spotlight. And I'm going to now introduce um, Tony Wilson. Um, one second, Tony. I'm just going to spotlight you first. Here we go. Tony, welcome. Over hi, to you. Everyone. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for, um, for uh, having me. My name is Tony Wilson. I'm the director at the Institute for Employment Studies. And I was just going to talk for a couple of minutes about um, some of the impacts um, on the labour market uh, during and since the pandemic, but more particularly 
around um, some of the impacts that we are seeing for disabled people um, and also people with long term um, long term health conditions in particular. So, um, so I do have a couple of slides I can that I can share, I think, um, but I won't um, I won't uh, overdo it on the slides, which is unusual for me. Um, so the, the, the first thing I just wanted to to show was let me just see if I can um, if I can make this work. Well, the first point I wanted to make was that the pandemic has had in the last couple of years has had a really significant impact on the labour market and on employment. And we've seen employment um, fall quite significantly. Um, and um, uh, even though, even though we've had, uh, you know, we've all heard heard these stories about um, unemployment reaching its lowest uh, ever levels, I just show. I'm just showing a graph now, which shows the employment rate, the unemployment rate, and something called the economic inactivity rate, which I'll explain in a second. And the middle graph shows that the, the unemployment rate rose a bit during the pandemic, but is now at its lowest since the early 1970s. But actually, employment fell during the pandemic, but hasn't really recovered. There's about 330,000 fewer people in employment overall compared with the pre-pandemic level. And this is because there are more people who are outside the labour force entirely, who aren't looking for work and aren't available for work. So the challenges that we had feared we would be dealing with around mass unemployment are not the ones that we've got. We've instead facing specific issues around um, falling participation in work, um, uh, labour shortages and skill shortages for employers, and, um, and now a cost of living crisis. And I, we, we argue, we have argued, that this is actually hitting disabled people particularly hard. So disabled people um, are, are, as we all know, are far less likely to be in work than non-disabled people. They're about two and a half times more likely to be out of work. So um, around half of all disabled people are in work compared with around, around half, beg your pardon, around half of all disabled people are out of work compared with around 20% of non-disabled people. But of course, we also know that disabled people who are in work face significant pay penalties, they're more likely to be low paid, and their pay is on, on average lower than for non-disabled people. Um, and, and we know that disabled people are much more likely to be in poverty. And I should say, you know, that um, about one in five of us are disabled or have a, a long-term health condition, uh, between one in five and one in four of us um, aged under 65. And there's a diversity of experiences there. And so in, you know, in some cases, employment rates are incredibly low, particularly where people have learning disabilities and difficulties or, um, or have severe uh, mental health problems. In other cases, employment rates can be relatively high, but on average, really significant disadvantages. Now, in the pandemic, this issue around um, rising worklessness, economic inactivity, has been particularly driven by long-term ill health. Um, and this is quite a broad, there's some definitional issues here, it's quite a broad um, uh, category, I suppose. The, the precise definition is, is anyone who, um, who says that they've got a long-term health condition or a disability, which significantly limits their day-to-day -day activities. So it's disability and ill health, in effect, are somewhat unhelpfully are kind of lumped together in how the Labour Force Survey reports on, on, on this. But what this shows is, this graph here is a graph now which I'm showing, which shows the number of people, the change in the number of people who have been, who are economically inactive by the length of time they've been economically inactive. So it breaks it down into people who, who last worked um, less than two years ago, who last worked between two and three years ago, who last worked three or more years ago, and then people who have never worked, um, and the change in the level of, of people in each of those categories. And what stands out in the graph, um, it's, it's shaded in, um, and dark blue to to identify um, where people have a, a, a have a long term ill health um, or disabled people has been that the really significant growth has been in people who've been out of work for more than three years and have a long term health condition or are disabled. And so I think this gets to a really important point that we focused a lot during the pandemic in people on on why people have left work and what jobs have been lost. But the bigger issues are around um, the fact that people are out of work and not uh, being a, are not able to come back into work. Uh, to the same extent that they were previously and that's particularly affecting people with long-term ill health with long-term health conditions and um, so that's um so that's so there's been a significant growth of more than 200,000 in a number of people who've been out of work for three or more years um, and have long-term health conditions um, alongside this actually we've also seen quite a worrying growth in a number of people who've never worked about 100,000 more people who have never worked and say that they have a long-term health condition 
um, or disability. And this group is predominantly people who, um, predominantly um, younger people, people aged under, under 30. So we, we estimate that around, there's now around 300,000 people aged under 30 who report having a long-term health condition or, um, or, or are disabled people um, who've never worked. Um, and before the pandemic, this was about 230,000. So it's grown by about a third um, uh, in the last three years. And so this means that actually the employment rate gap for disabled people is widening at a time. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy to send my slides, my slides through. That's absolutely fine. There's just a question there about um, if slides will be available. So um, the employment rate gap is widening when it's been narrowing um, over recent years. It's been far too wide, but it has been narrowing over, over recent years. It's now widening again. Um, and, and I think there are signs in particular disabled people are, are moving, um, are, are, um, uh, are finding it harder and harder to, to move into work and dis more and more disadvantaged in the labour market. So a couple of final points, really, just to try to try to say, what, 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 what can we do about this and what's driving this? I think fundamentally, we've got a couple of linked challenges. The first is that we simply don't invest enough in supporting people who have long term health conditions and supporting disabled people. Um, to get the sorts of employment related support that would um, better enable them to return to work um, and to support effective, um, effective returns to work. We know the sorts of models that work, like supported internships, where there's been a welcome expansion recently, but I think we can do much more. Um, supported employment more, more generally, actually, too. Um, there's other models, too, around, um, for example, access to employment advice through talking therapies, where people have long term mental health conditions um, and more specialist disability employment support that many of you will deliver or, or will be aware of. Now, funding for this has been reduced. It's increasingly fragmented. And with the loss of the European Social Fund, we simply don't have enough access to support. So I think um, so I think there's a lot more that we can do around providing access to that support. Secondly, though, I think we need to reach people better through the services that they use and to provide the support that people want. And, um, and we rely too much at the moment on delivery through Job Centre Plus, for example, which I don't think is a very supportive environment for supporting, um, for supporting people um, uh, to prepare for and return to work. We need to be thinking much more about how we can support people through community organisations, through uh, health services, through other, other services, other local and national services too. Um, but the final point is employers really, really need to step up. Um, and I, I, I think it will need repeating in, in this group, but um, just to commend the work of, um, of, of, of DRUK and Disability at Work group and others around developing the Disability Employment Charter, which we were, very, which we were really pleased to sign up to as well. Um, employers need to report, need to better understand their own workforces, look at how they can make flexibility at work the default, um, not something that always needs to be requested, invest more in effective occupational um, and vocational support at work, but also really focus on how we can make work um, more inclusive, more secure, more rewarding, and provide better access to workplace, workplace support so that people um, uh, so, so, so that people are able to, um, to succeed at work and to, um, and, and, to, and to remain in work too. So uh, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of areas that we need to focus on and do, and do more on. Um, I feel like we're a long way from doing that. Um, but final point, we've just launched a commission on the future of employment support, um, which we'd be really keen to, um, to hear from anyone who's involved in this, in this space um, and who has views on. And you can, you can find that on our website. Um, you can also find it, uh, there's a link which I can put in the chat as well, um, bit.ly forward slash employment hiking commission. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it'd be, it'd be great, to, uh, great to hear from you and, 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 and to have your input on that work as well. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks very much, Tony. And um, you mentioned the Disability Employment Charter. I'll put a link to the website, uh, Disability Employment Charter. If anyone is here today who's representing an organization and you want to sign up to that charter, please do have a look at that um, website and um, there's contact details of how to add your name to it. Tony, thank you. I'm going to now try and get everyone uh, back into the spotlight. So if you just bear with me. Um, so I know it's Amelia. Okay, Rob, it's not allowing me to um, spotlight people. Do you know if something's changed? And could you spotlight the panel back for the Q and A, please? Sorry, yeah, uh, let me just. So we need um, yeah. Amelia, um, Chloe, and mm -hmm. Tony and myself 
HV. Okay, I can add my cell. Let's see if I can add a new gear. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, I think that's everybody. Um, and Rob, do you want to take over and do the Q&A? So um, I think people have started to type questions in to the chat, which we can pick up from. And But if anyone hasn't typed something in, but would like to raise a question, or ask a question or make a comment, um, and you want to do it verbally, then you can um, please raise your hand digitally and we'll come to you as well. So Rob, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Cameron. Um, so I think Rona, will I pass over to you for your first for the first question? Sorry, was that me? Yeah. Is that me? Yeah. No, I'm struggling to hear because it's um, well, there's three people unmuted at the moment. Um, so if everyone who's not speaking can go unmute because your voice is really distorted, Rob. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, um, I think at the beginning, somebody said something about how do we change uh, the fact that disabled people are neglected, ignored, marginalized, always at the back of the queue and at the lowest of priority. Um, and how we change that is I think we need to sort of change the political system that is um, so at the moment uh, very kind of far right and neoliberal. And this has kind of infected the, uh, the the so called left wing as well, in so far as it's a system where it's based on the American way of doing things. It's a survival of the fittest system where uh, the preservation of life is superseded by the preservation of profit and greed. And the way that we change that is by, uh, I suppose, by sort of showing people that that the alternatives are viable because I think people have been brainwashed by a media, a billionaire media that supports the uh, neoliberal um, right wing uh, government system that we have. So people read the media and they don't question what they're reading. They just sort of accept that that's the truth, even though it's, it's you know, 90 percent propaganda. So I think we need to kind of like sort of like win the battle of hearts and minds in terms of showing people that you know, that, 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 that every life is valuable and every person has got something to offer the world instead of the idea of the survival of the fittest and that it is only people who are physically and mentally fit, as in fit for purpose, are worth saving and anyone who is um, suffering, uh, well, not suffering, not, well, anyone who is suffering, but anyone who is living with long-term conditions or anyone who is uh, classified as disabled is not worth as much rather than valuing every life as being equal, we value certain lives above others because of the system that we're under. And it's a, it's a, it's a mindset, it's a government mindset that's been filtered down into the rest of us. So we need to sort of like maybe talk to people about the fact that, you know, that there's a lot of brainwashing going on. And I don't think it's going to be a, an, an easy process. I think it's going to be an extremely uh, laborious process. I think it's going to go on for, for decades because We've actually had a form of neoliberalism since uh, 1980 when Margaret Thatcher first became prime minister. Um, I think before that we were much more collectivist and much more compassionate society. And I think several people had probably in the 80s, particularly around the beginning of the Thatcher era, the, the disabled people won a lot of hard won victories and made a lot of strides forward. And that's all being pushed back now. So sorry to be a negative ninny, but that's just my, uh, that's my opinion. I'm just wondering what the panel thinks. Oh, th thank you for that, that uh, Rona. And actually, ch you know, changing perceptions is probably one of the hardest things to do, isn't it? Uh, when you're talking about the whole nation and how do we change the perception of who we are as disabled people? And Chloe, you were talking about some of this, weren't you, in, in terms of the work that your centre is doing? Did you have any thoughts on kind of what? Do, how do we? How do we do what Rona's highlighting? Is change perceptions and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rona, as well. Um, going back to what you said, yeah, about, about politics is our first ever report that we did was around representation and disabled people are just simply not, you know, at the decision making tables. Only 8% of members of parliament 
as, as far as we are aware, um, have, you know, have declared that they are disabled. And that number for local councillors across the country is very similar to, it's a similar percentage. So if disabled people aren't involved in decision making and aren't involved in setting the direction of, like you said, either their communities or the country or workplaces, whatever that might be, then, then people are not always going to take disabled people into consideration and people are going to get left out of those conversations. So I completely, you know, agree with that. And, you know, and not to, to touch on anyone else's um, you know, we're going to talk about we're here from all the other panelists, but like you said, people have to fight every single step of the way. We just released a report um, around the census, you know, the census system, and it was something like 65% of the parents that we spoke to said that they had to fight, you know, just to get what they needed. And we all know that that's the case from, you know, anecdotally that we know that that's what goes on. So I feel like, you know, the top priority is, is, is ensuring that whether it's our workplaces or our governments that disabled people are the, at the heart of the decision making and then you know the policies will follow on from there so that for me and, and actually going back to your point around you know the last sort of 20 30 years i feel that what we have lost is maybe our sense of community and our sense of the importance on family and and tony in his graphs there was a big uh a uh, big number of people that have stepped out of the employment market because of caring responsibilities or looking after the home and I feel that you know the world has changed massively over the last 20 years and the structure of you know who goes to work and, and, and family dynamics and I, I think we've sort of lost that sense of like you said looking out for one another which definitely needs to you know be improved. Thanks Chloe and your point about um, the figures you gave around numbers of disabled people in politics being so low um, a few years ago, Disability Rights UK ran the Enable Fund, which was specifically a, 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 it was almost like an access to work, but it was if you were trying to enter into politics, whether it be local councillors or MPs, and it actually proved to be incredibly successful. So it was a pilot one year programme. They called it a pilot, government called it a pilot, but actually it was a repeat of something that had happened a few years before that as well. So it wasn't really a pilot. It ran for a year, was very successful, and then it was shut down. Um, and actually the, the independent report itself showed that if you provide support and you start to remove the barriers, disabled people will want to enter all sorts of aspects of everyday. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? It kind of feels so obvious. And so it's, it's sometimes it's kind of you left a bit staggered as to why are we not just continuing this um, when it showed proved to be so, so, so effective. Um, Tony and Amelia, is there anything you wanted to come back to on Rona's points. Tony? I'm, I'm really happy just to make a couple of observations. One is um, that I think if we're thinking about workplaces, I, I think, you know, shining a light on this is really, really important. And we should have, you know, the government really should introduce or a future government should introduce mandatory reporting on, on the number of people in a workplace who are disabled, the, the proportion of the workforce who are, who are disabled and, and also on, on the pay gaps for disabled people. And the two go together, you know, it is about lower participation in work and lower pay. What we want to avoid is employers feeling like, oh, we need to close a pay gap. The best way to close a pay gap is often just to employ fewer people, particularly in lower paid work, for example. And we want to see more, more opportunity and then those opportunities to progress as well. So the two go together. But, you know, this has had a transformative effect in looking. I'm not, I'm not going to oversell it. It hasn't changed the world, but gender pay and the focus on gender pay that that requirements report has introduced has led to you know has had a transformative effect in how firms think about what how they can how they can better support participation better help people stay in work and support progression for women particularly in low, lower paying jobs so i do think that's a, that's a really important part of it but the other part of it is you know fundamentally in the workplace you know, as we i think as we all know one of the major concerns the misconceptions that firms will have is around well if I employ somebody with a health condition, if I advertise jobs more flexibly, if I take somebody on who is disabled, then uh, they will be less productive or it will cost me money or whatever. And and we have to we have to we do have to win some of those arguments about why that is often not the case and shouldn't and shouldn't be the case. But also it comes back this comment in the chat about the social model of disability. It's also about how we make sure that that we that collectively as employers, as government, as society, that we're making workplaces more adaptable more supportive and so that people can be you know can be productive in work can can be well rewarded in work and can and can and um and, and can get into work and stay in work and access to work is you know the only means really by which we do that at the moment and it isn't 
working as well as it should. It just isn't. And other countries do many, many, not all by any means, but many other countries do do some of this better. You know, they 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 do they they're able to work better with employers. They have more effective rehabilitation support systems and, and can better make some of those adaptations in, in work. So I think there's a set of things we need to do as well around how we can how we can make sure that. That the, the, the system isn't rigged, if you like, in the way that you've described, Ron. That, that that can that can you know that within sort of li liberal in a liberal market, I suppose, it can mean that employers feel inherently incentivized to try to just employ predominantly. This is an age issue as well. Predominantly, you know, young, able, best educated um, uh, uh, workforces, and will recognise that there's a diversity of um, of of, of um, yeah that 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 the we're a bigger country than that, I suppose. Um, that we can do better than that. Thank you, Tony. I'm going to come over to Amelia. Yeah, so one, I want to thank Frona for these observations. Um, I would probably add that I don't think it's Thatcherism that started this whole debate. I think it's actually the Industrial Re Re Revolution and it's linked to ableism, um, which I believe C C Colin B Barnes has some great work on. Um, so the whole idea of kind of going to a workhouse if you can't physically or otherwise participate in the l l labour system is really what kind of was a massive um, influence on ableism within the UK specifically. Um, unsurprisingly, I'm probably going to focus on education. Um, so I think that Having a truly inclusive education system from the very beginning to all the way through um, the education sectors is really important. Um, just this month, we've seen a report from the Children's Commissioner's Office um, that rather conflates um, care with education for children as young as two, which means their placement within education from the very um, beginning is going to be kind of marred and potentially segregated, which is going to affect their um, the children's access to the curriculum, um, their development and all kinds of other things that obviously I stand very much against. But this in the higher education sector really does affect the pipeline. And what you were saying, Tony, about a lot of these kind of people that are outside the labour market now are under 30. And I'd be really interested in what the factors of that would be. Is it because they don't have the qualifications? Is it because they have caring responsibilities for a member of their family? Like, why is it that the younger generation are being hit? Is it actually a legacy of segregated education? And how difficult it is to get into higher education? specifically to stay in higher education and to get those qualifications that al allow you choices within the labour market um I think it's a really good question and I think actually this starts a lot earlier than people really realize and the ramifications of our current policy have actually been here for de de decades um and so even if we do improve policy now we still have the historical legacy of what has happened before um and how we're going to deal with that and how we're going to include everyone in society whether that's in work contributing or however people can best contribute to the society I think there is a lot of different ways you can shape employment whether it be volunteering community work um, and actually paying you know disabled people's organizations to be able to employ other disabled people to get them on the ladder and um, to build confidence to build experience as my colleague Meta has put in the chat there's a massive issue culturally around what disabled people are capable of and this is something that DSUK is kind of very much focused on in terms of we are expertise um, or experts I should say in the field with expertise we are disabled people with you know degrees and education from you know the most prestigious universities in the country um but we don't sell that without pointing out the incredible inequality and incredible um inaccessibility of getting to that point and we recognize that so many young disabled people have been left behind by education and society in general unless we come together and really look at this from a holistic point of view from both kind of education in independent living support you know the cost of living crisis all of those different things thank you amelia um i'm just going to come on to some of the questions in the chat before bridget i come to you i know you've raised your hand uh, so vicky livingston said is it possible to have a copy of the slides after the meeting so yeah we'll get them sent out um it will be the equality trust that will send um, the presentations out so that's not a problem at all 
Um, Crystal says, please could you explain the difference between people with disabilities and those with long-term health conditions? I guess from my perspective, at Disability Rights UK, we do talk about disabled people and those with long-term health conditions. We do that specifically because a lot of people with long-term health conditions, and it can often be, we often could be talking about older people, for example, who have health conditions, They those individuals often don't see themselves as disabled people. They may just think, well, I've got a health condition, um, you know, such as uh, cancer or MS or something, and they may not immediately think that, that, that they are a disabled person as a result. And of course, if we understand the social model of disability, we're talking about the barriers that we experience as a result of um, the, the society and people's attitudes and things that we're talking about, about policies and how those discriminate. Um, so that's that's kind of the different perspective that we have. Um, we meet a lot of older people, you know, for example, someone, my father has Parkinson's, but he doesn't ever talk about himself as a disabled man. Um, he just says, I have Parkinson's as a health condition. So that's kind of the difference, but uh, um, uh, I don't know if there's any other perspective on that in the panel. No, okay. Um, Meta then says, is the number of disabled people, this is for you, Tony, is the number of disabled people out of work increasing for non-mental health related disabilities as well? It's a question. Yes, it does appear to be. It does appear that the growth um, that in people out of work with long-term health conditions or disability, and I very much agree with Cameron, Cameron's sort of description of, 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 of those terms, the, um, it is rising both for mental health conditions, but also for, um, for example, musculoskeletal conditions been quite a significant rise and for other factors, some of which could be related to long COVID. It could be the sort of the fatigue, um, uh, you know, fatigue, fatigue related conditions or you know, long-term sort of post-viral conditions. There's actually some good analysis that was done on this fairly recently, which showed that often it's multiple conditions, actually, which I think we would all know and recognise where you've been out of work for a long time, then mental health can often deteriorate. So it can be a combination kind of comorbid, if you like, um, you know, physical and men mental and um, mental health conditions. Um, it's quite a worrying picture. Um, Generally, I think one of the questions which I think people will be aware of is, is you know, um, is around how we is around how we understand disability employment given uh, disability employment gaps, given that that the prevalence of long term health conditions is increasing. And I think that's an area where I'd defer. there are others that will know, you know, know this know these issues much, much better than than me. But but, you know, some of the gains that we've seen, some of the increases in employment are things we might have expected to see anyway because the population is getting older and people are staying in work and more people have health conditions. So the underlying picture might even be slightly more negative than we might have thought. Amelia, I'd love to follow up separately on the points you made around, um, around young people, because I think it's something I'm really concerned about and it's coming out quite clearly in the data. And I, and I think I would defer to you really and, and your networks in understanding some of what's driving, driving that. I fear that, I fear that it's partly that the young disabled people were not doing enough to support those transitions into work like post university so i'm sure there's an education exclusion aspect to it i think there's then though a po that sort of post education piece about what how support is lined up to help people progress and and it seems from some of the work we've done we talked to people who've been to you know who, who um, people in university who are, who are disabled you know moving into jobs that just don't match their skills or 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 ex expertise and and you know significantly disadvantaged and can't get access to the sorts of adaptations that might enable them to um to find the right jobs um you know because it's quite hard to get that in advance of taking the job among other things but we'll pick up separately it'd be good to stay in touch on that yeah, and tony just on that point so there's another point made in the chat around the never worked group under 30 is there data on their educational attainment no, but I saw that question in the chat. I think that's. I, th I think you're right. I mean, there's. Um, yes, you know, we we know that we know that there is definitely quite a strong overlap around. Well, there's a very. I could have shown you a different graph actually as well, which showed about employment outcomes for people with lower qualifications. You know, very very poor as well. You're more than twice as likely to be out of work if you don't have um, GCSE level qualifications. If you as if you do. Um, and and so actually, you know, there, there's a lot that in a lot of cases, these disadvantages can can multiply and, and, and you know, and you do get these overlapping disadvantages, if you like. So I'm sure that's that's a, a large factor, too, is that sort of deeper social exclusion. Mm. OK, thank you. Um, Tony. I'm going to come to uh, people who raised their hands. So, Bridget, over to you. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear me well? 
Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, I'm a PhD student and I'm uh, researching on the uh, impact of COVID-19 on uh, older ethnic minorities in the UK. So um, uh, one of the um, theories underpinning my research is intersectionality. And I am looking at uh, older age as a factor and then disability also and uh, race. So I'm particularly interested in the older uh, disabled people. They encounter not only challenges as disabled people, but also ages and, and the like. So then my question to you, Chloe and Tony, is um, when you are dealing with disability issues, are you also working with the data that is disaggregated according to old age and disability and um, ethnic minorities also? Because uh, as we know, these people are impacted more, they have compound, more compounded disadvantages. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bridget. Uh, shall I come to Chloe and Tony? Do you want to, one of you want to start? Chloe, do you want to? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Thank off? you. Thanks, Bridget. It's good to hear you. And it's good to hear about your research as well. I'll be interested to speak more about that. Um, yeah, that is something that we've sort of, we're, we're, we're still quite new, but we recently held an event about a month ago, sort of looking at intersectionality and having this conversation as well. And I know that, you know, across different communities, you know, talking about, uh, you know, talking about disability as well is, is something that's at different stages too. And it's something we're going to look into on our research over the coming year as well. Um, but I, I completely agree with you. Like you said, there are many sort of issues that people are not speaking about currently and delving into that sort of intersectional, um, you know, experience is, is incredibly, you know, incredibly important. This is something I sort of did in my previous life as well. And, um, and particularly, like you said, around older people, I'd be really keen to hear your research and hear your insights too. So thank you for sharing. Thank you, Chloe. Tony? And well, on the employment data, um, unfortunately, the, the data is quite hard to look at, um, at, at um, many of these uh, um, uh, sort of Equality Act, I, I suppose, um, protected characteristics in combination because the sample sizes for the surveys is all reliant on this survey data aren't that aren't that large um and so it's, so it's it, it's not it's not something that we do as as regularly and it's not published regularly by the office of national statistics what i would say though is that certainly looking at um age and um ill health and disability for example you know there's a really strong as you'd expect a really strong um co uh, correlation that you know um the people are more likely to be off work due to ill health where they're older than where they're younger but having said that in the pandemic we have you know we have looked at this there's been growth actually across age groups in in people out of work due to a long-term health condition or disability and it's often been for slight, you know for some different reasons at different at different ages as well um so unfortunately like the data yeah it's quite it's quite unsatisfactory to really get to this quantitatively. I think actually what Chloe is talking about, understanding sort of lived experiences and more qualitatively hearing from, from you know, like the research that you're doing, I think can be much more, much more instructive and help us sort of try to you know, fill in and understand some of those, some of those gaps a bit better, I think. Great, thank you both. And I think intersectionality is a really important aspect that's often forgotten. We often try and compartmentalize people into so many different boxes when actually the intersects are really important and the kind of added inequality that those bring for people in, in every aspect of life, employment, education, but other aspects as well. So thank you for that question and responses. Um, there's a comment from um, Andrew Miller who says, in my experience, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the biggest challenges is to get politicians and civil servants to accept the social model. Currently government grasp of ableism is non-existent. I think we all will, probably would agree with that. I'm getting nodding heads. Any comments from anybody on any of that? Or as to kind of how do we tackle that really, I guess, is the question. I mean, I think one of the things is we've touched on it earlier, Andrew, was around finding mechanisms and support systems that enable disabled people to enter political life. So we actually have disabled people in, in those groups that you're talking about, both politicians and civil servants, and making that journey barrier-free, friction-free, um, and with the right support at the right points, that would be my initial thought. Um, 
Chloe or Tony or Amelia, any thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Um, I think, yeah, it's a challenge. I think one glaring thing is that there is no, there is very little politicians and civil servants with lived experience of disability that actually understand the real life impacts of of what happens in these policies and what happens within these systems. I do think as well, we are within a political system that is very individualized and that kind of your circumstances or your level of poverty or your level of need is largely defined by your individual responsibility, which I completely disagree with, um, as you might imagine. But I think that's a really hard point to get back from. And I also think that we have to recognize that I'm sure people on this call are quite comfortable speaking about disability and ableism and the structural kind of barriers that people face. But I think this is a very terrifying and threatening conversation for a lot of people, mostly because disability can affect anyone at any time. And a lot of times it is reduced to a conversation about weakness and supremacy and survival of the fittest and a lot of people just simply either don't want to have that conversation or are not in a place to be educated around that in a way that can be constructive so I think there's kind of two things there one we desperately need governmental representation but two I think as a society we need to face some of these realities of what disability actually is and how we collectively come together to kind of find solutions but kind of break down some of the structural issues that are causing the problem which um is a very big ask but I live in optimism if not complete um skepticism most of the time on this um but yeah I think it's it's a big fight that we have to do step by step um is probably the s sensible answer yeah thank you Amelia so I'm just conscious of time and I know Rona's had her hand up for a while so I'm going to come to you Rona and that'll be I think the final question because I want to let you all go home and have your dinners and whatever else. Um, Rona. Well I, I am home in bed but uh, yeah I, I just wanted Rob to repeat his answer because you were unmuted at the same time and his voice just sounded extremely distorted and there was a point that Rob made which I wanted to come back on because I didn't understand the point and now I've completely forgotten what he said because my memory is so poor so I'd be grateful if Rob could repeat his answer to my point uh, and for everyone else to stay muted so that I could hear what he was saying. I'm sorry about this, but I, I, it was, there was a point that he made, which I really felt I felt I needed to pick up on. And then you kind of just like move the conversation on and, 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 and I couldn't really hear what he was saying. So if you could be kind enough, please, Rob. Sure. Rob, do you remember? Sorry, no, I have no, I don't have a memory of, of, of that. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, well, my point was about the fact that the uh, the system is, is rigged against disabled people because of the neoliberal uh, values of the last 40 years, especially the last 40 years. Uh, yeah, probably going back to the Industrial Revolution workhouses, but certainly in the last 40 years reinforced. Um, so my point was, I mean, I agree with the last speaker who said that people are threatened by conversations around uh, disability equality because it does threaten the uh, the sort of uh, ecosystem of neoliberalism which which a lot of people have benefited from but uh, maybe one might those people might be just one percent of the population who are billionaires but those are the people who control the media those are the people in government those are the people whose voices are represented so uh, you responded to you know eloquently to to that point that i'd made a few 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 minutes ago but i couldn't hear your response oh, i, I think, think I think it might it have been Tony, sorry, yeah. not, not me, not Rob. Okay, oh. I, I'm really quickly, then I'm conscious of the time too, if you go on mute, Rob, and then hopefully, Rona, you can hear me. Just the two points I was making was one was around transparent reporting by employers of, um, uh, of employment of disabled people and pay of disabled people, because I think um, transparency would help to drive change. Um, but the second was around um, reforming how how we provide workplace um support and adaptations so how, how we address i suppose thinking about the sort of social model of disability how we how we try to address that in workplaces how we should expect that from employers too but also how we can reform things like access to work and others that was in a nutshell that was the, the two broad points i was trying to make 
Okay, thank you, Tony. Okay. And what we will do, um, and I'll, I'll check with colleagues at Equality Trust about the transcript from the um, uh, speech to text system, we'll save that and then we can always mail that out to people because it has captured what every one of us was saying at, throughout the points and it, it says who said what. So we will capture that. So it is, we are right on seven o'clock and I do want to stop on time. So I just want to really thank all of you who've joined us this evening. I think the hour is never long enough and we could talk about these topics in a great more depth and have uh, really interesting, stimulating conversations. Um, so I just want to thank everybody um, who joined us today, but thank you also very much to the panel. Uh, so to Tony, Chloe, Meta, Amelia, and um, to colleagues from Equality Trust, uh, Rob, who's who's been supporting, and to Liz, who's um, done a sterling job of kind of interpreting us all throughout the whole hour and not had a break. So thank you very much, Liz, for doing that. Really appreciate it. Um, this is being recorded, so you will be able to watch this again on the Equality Trust website, um, and we'll get the um, transcript and handout sent around to everybody else. And I guess what I would just say is, despite all of the change, I think we have, you know, immense ability and capability in um, in our in our community as disabled people. And I guess what I would say from Disability Rights UK point is, whatever our differences might be as different people. I think where we've got lots of commonality is in the inequality that we experience and the time is to come together at no greater time in my life. Now is the time that our organizations must come together and speak with this unified voice that this inequality we won't stand for and it's not um, and that we want change and that we are a powerful group. Um, if you just talk about the numbers of us who are out there, uh, we're a powerful group and we have the ability to change things. Um, so I'll leave it on that and thank you all very much and have a lovely evening.